Michael. Can you hear me? Michael Curtis, thank you for being here. Hey, it's glad to be here. Um, I think it's usually boring to tell people how people met, but I'm going to do that anyway, because this is my show and I can do that. But before, before I do that, I have three questions for you. Mm -hmm. They're quick hitters. We're going to find out a little bit about your personality. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. First question. Better first date, drinks or dinner? Drinks. Okay. Second question, Spain or France? Spain. All right. That's, that was definitive, and I respect that. <laughs> um, last question, carpet or hardwood? Hardwood. It's a very Californian answer. I'm um, going to hardwood. So we met because here at Writer's Block, I'm in the physical space of Writer's Block in Los Angeles, and not far from us uh, is a boulevard called Washington Boulevard that you don't live very far from. And uh, a few years ago, we had a booth, a writer's block booth in a festival that was happening on that street. And you wandered up and you were like, oh, you know, I've been, I've been meaning to write a little bit more because I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, you were working on a children's book at the time. Yes, I was. And uh, you said, what are you guys doing? We told you about stuff and, and you said, oh, that's cool. I, you know, I, I used to do a little writing. I'm hoping to get a little more writing in my life. And I was like, oh, what'd you used to write? And you said, oh, just friends. And I was amazed at the humility of a person like you. And uh, I've been a fan of yours ever since. So thank oh. you for being humble. I, I, since Trump, I try to do my best to be as humble as possible. I just want to, I want to be, I want to succeed in my humbleness. It's a rare, it's a rare, uh, it's a rare skill here in Los Angeles, especially. And that makes, go ahead. There was a great uh, Peanuts cartoon from years and years ago where Linus said he just wants to be a humble country doctor going from town to town in his red sports car. <laughs> and that's you? I, I've always lived by that motto. <laughs> Do you, did you ever get ahead of yourself? Did you ever feel like you started to think you knew too much about writing or, or about success or any of those things? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. I think I got, uh, I got a little more complacent than ahead. Mm. Um, at the beginning, I think I was very, uh, I, you know, kept watched what other people were doing and kind of tried to fit in which is also always a good way to go. And then I just sort of got into the groove and was okay. I, I don't think I ever went, I know, unless I was talking to like network executives or somebody like that, I never really thought I know more than you do. <laughs> hopefully there's no, actually, hopefully there are some network executives listening. Um, do you, what do you attribute that to? Because it would seem to me if you were writing at such the level that you were writing, because when you're working on when you were working on friends it had to be the most popular tv show at least sitcom going unless we count like i don't know the abc nightly news and that doesn't count um we're always when when i was there at the uh from season two to season five we were always behind seinfeld seinfeld was nbc's baby that was their mm -hmm. that was their thing and uh and we were always behind seinfeld um if you remember uh, back in those, in fact, all the time, Friends was on at eight o'clock and Seinfeld was on at, I think at nine o'clock. But, uh, you know, so Friends was on at, at eight o'clock in the Midwest, it was on at seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine, it had such great ratings. We were, always, we were always, I think this kind of stung us a little bit because if you can imagine Friends, if you, you saw what Friends ratings were at seven o'clock mm -hmm. in Kansas, imagine what they would have been at eight o'clock in Kansas. You well, know, just, it, it would have been, people are still outside playing at that seven o'clock. That, yeah, this is a, we could do an entire podcast on the differences um, of when TV was on, because as you uh, mentioned, I'm from Kansas. So all shows that I wanted to watch were probably on at seven o'clock. And because my parents uh, were big on early bedtimes, I was probably in bed by eight 30. So like, it was good that friends was on early. Um, so I guess that makes sense to people who live on the coast. To me, it's like you're talking to an alien. 
I but that's, that's okay. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Why, why TV? Like, how did you end up writing in TV? Take, can you take us through that saga? Well, I wanted to be a writer. I was writing, I was sort of writing features, just spec features. Um, early in my career, I had a, I was working with a partner and I had, I had written some, some spec scripts, spec feature scripts, and, and then he and I wrote something. We wrote, uh, back in those days, there was this thing on, uh, on uh, Showtime, no, Cinemax, called Cinemax Comedy Experiment or something like that, where they would do like 30-minute short films. And so we wrote something to sort of fit into that, a sort of a 30-minute short film, but, film, but movie-esque. Mm -hmm. And when we were showing that script to people, somebody said, uh, oh, that the, the I, I, sent, I sent my a couple of spec features to this to a person and this 30 minute thing. And she said, uh, yeah, the features are really good, but this TV thing you did is great. And we thought, TV thing? What? And they said, yeah, you should be a TV writer. So we sort of switched gears mm -hmm. and uh, got into it that way. And luckily we wrote a couple spec TV pilots back in those days. Uh, when you're writing a spec pilot, it's always good. Nowadays, I don't think people write uh, specs of shows that are already on anymore. I think the fashionable thing now is to write something that's original, which is perfectly great as far as I think. But uh, back in those days, you would find a show that, you know, you, you kind of had to measure balance it as something you wanted to write because you would have to work on it and write it, but also something that not everybody else was writing so that when somebody gets it on their, an executive gets it on their desk or an agent gets it on their desk, they don't go, ugh, another, you know, another cheers back at, this would be back in the cheers days. So uh, we wrote a Mad About You, which was a show, it was enough of a hit show, but also not such a hit show that everybody was writing Mad About Use. And people, like, we got a couple of meetings based on that, but then uh, uh, that's sort of how we ended up in TV, basically. Someone saying, oh, you wrote something that was 30 pages long. It must be TV. <laughs> if, uh, if only we could all have such clear direction in our lives. It, it, took, a, it took a couple of years. But, yeah. Uh, well, so I guess then my my follow-up question would be why screenwriting in the first place? As in, why not emergency medicine or uh, lawnmower repair? What led you into wanting to write for the screen? I just, that's just what I grew up loving. I was always watching, uh, just watching shows about movies. I loved movies. I loved, you know, I love I loved TV shows too. I mean, I I I grew up watching a lot of reruns. Um, uh, you know, after school, like where I was growing up near San Diego, there was a Channel Six, which is sort of the Fox affiliate there now. But back then, it was the uh, sort of the it, it would have been here. It would have been like Channel Five or or something like that. But they showed that after you know, starting at three thirty was like the Odd Couple, Mash, uh, Andy Griffith Show, Looney Tunes. Um, and just all through, and those were the shows that I, that I watched. And then, at, you know, in prime time, I think Happy Days was on. That was great. Mork and Mindy. I remember watching the very first Mork and Mindy going, oh, my God, this is the greatest I've ever seen. And, uh, and so I was just into that sort of entertainment vibe. But just, I just liked it. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, there was, I didn't know what else to do, actually. That was <laughs> I feel like that leads a lot of us to where we end up. I didn't know what else to do. Um, did you, were you writing as a kid? Like, did you? Um... I did. I wrote a, a lot. I was writing all the time as a kid. I wrote, I still, I just snagged them out of my parents' garage a, a few months ago, a big binders where I wrote this uh, uh, a Lord of the Rings parody. Oh, nice. That's obviously no, not nearly as good as the Harvard Lampoon one that came out in the early 70s. But, uh, and just stuff short, a lot of short stories, a lot of stuff like that. And I look back at it now and most of it's ridiculous, but, but I was doing it. You know, It'd be amazing if you looked, you were like, I look back now and that was my best work. That was, <laughs> I was overlooked as an eight year old and I feel like I should have gotten my due in third grade. Um, did you feel like 
were you a funny kid? Um, I think so. I mean, people who are, I think when it's happening, you don't go, I'm the funny kid, but I think you look back and you, you look back and go, yeah, I think I, I did funny stuff. I hung out with funny friends mm -hmm. and, uh, like, I think the first, one of the first things I wrote in school was commercial parodies for a, a sign, a writing assignment in, I think in eighth grade mm. and we acted them out and stuff like that. That's and, it, an amazing um, bit of time and space travel in that I remember in seventh grade getting to make a, a parody commercial as well. I wonder if that was like in some st like curriculum somehow that we both had. I don't know. I don't know if it was part of the curriculum. I think it was like write a f write five minutes of presentation. Mm -hmm. And that's what I happened to do. Somebody else may have done George Washington's night on the Delaware kind of right. thing. Uh, but that's what I did. Now, now that looking, thinking back, it was like commercial parodies. It was like, you know, I was into Saturday Night Live and, mm -hmm. you know, from back in the day, back in the pre eighties, late seventies mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so I think I was just drawn to it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, um, did you ever perform comedy? Were you, did you ever get into that scene? When I graduated from college, my friends and I, who I'd gone to college with, I, we had, we had sort of known each other in high school, then sort of reconnected when I was going to San Diego state for a couple of years and a couple of other more people from there glommed on. And then I, I went away to San Francisco State. And then when I came back, we started doing public a public access show in San Diego. This would have been like mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And it was basically at that time, today we'd have done a ripoff of Kids in the Hall. But back then we did a ripoff of SCTV. Mm -hmm. And so it was that the sort of sketches, studio stuff, a lot of live, not live, but, uh, you know, out exterior stuff and that kind of thing. So that was, we all sort of acted in that. I, I wouldn't say I was any good at it, but, uh, but so in answer to your question, yes. And with, and with so, a caveat. Yeah. And so it, it seems like that would fit into the, the battle cry of, of, first of all, just start doing stuff. Just do it. Yeah. Um, did you when you were working at that level, was it, I have an eye on, I want to head in a certain direction or was it more, this is fun and I want to just do it every week or was it some combination thereof? I think it was a little bit more like, this is fun. I just want to do this every week. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And then gradually, gradually things, basically things that steered me into where I am now or where I started as to where I am now. Mm -hmm. We're not tied to this other than just the, the idea of having fun and doing it. And the guys, I think I was more ambitious than the other people. They, they all, you know, somebody got married and somebody, they had the real jobs. People started going, well, I can't really work all day this weekend on this script you wrote and kind mm -hmm. of thing. So gradually we just sort of, I think the last episode, we only, we only did, I think we did one episode a month. So it was like, we did like seven episodes and the seventh episode we did, we had, it was our most ambitious. And then when we went back over the tape and one of the tapes was screwed up. So it never really registered and everybody just went, ah, fuck it. <laughs> and we were done. <laughs> Sorry. Can it, I swear? I think it's allowed. Yes. Okay. Do you, um, it, it seems to me, uh, especially having lived in LA for a while now that, um, a lot of TV writing is that war of attrition um, of people who are just, that just continue to be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. um, what, like, were there markers along the way? Obviously, you know, a, a, somebody who knew things saying, maybe you should, you know, write TV is, is somewhat helpful because it's guidance. But were there markers away, along the way that helped you keep going? Because I think it's also interesting to think about how do you know when to keep going? Because at some point, like if I said, I want to be a brain surgeon, there would have to be, a, there would be a lot of failures and not a lot of like um, markers that I should keep going. 
And so it can be confusing to us because we hear all the time, well, it'll just keep going, just keep going. What did you find as, you know, cheerleading or, or spots where you thought like, yeah, I can, I can do this and I'll keep doing it. That was probably the first big one mm -hmm. where somebody who was a professional television executive said, this is really good. You should do this. Mm -hmm. And that's where I kind of went, okay, great. That's where a door opened and a, and a little bit more of a light was, sh was shined, shown, shunned on the, uh, on the uh, path. It became a little clearer what needed to be done. And whereas up until then, it was really just sort of stumbling along, trying to figure things out. But I should say at the same time, I was, I was working on sort of these low budget features as an assistant director and as a PA and things like that. So it wasn't like I was working as a waiter or working in an office somewhere. I was actually in quote unquote in show business, which was made it uh, more fun anyway, as I struggled to reach this goal. Mm -hmm. So you were but probably, that was, the, that was the first place. That was the first time where someone said, you should do this. So you're also, you know, close enough to it where you could probably start to tell like, oh, this is what it takes to do this. And I have at least some of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, I was working on a low budget movie and I gave, after, when the movie was done, I gave the producers one of the spec features I had written and said, what do you think? And they said, oh, well, we can, let's do this next. Mm. And I said, that's great. Um, I want to direct it. <laughs> and they said, nope. <laughs> I said, all right, all right, well then let's do it. And then gradually, I think the company went out of business or something. It was, it was one of those straight to video type companies back in the day. What, what took you from this, this uh, sense that you could do it and a couple of signals that maybe you could do it to writing for friends, which while maybe not number one in the world, was easily number two and may go down in history uh, easily in the top 10 of sitcoms of all time. It did well. It did well. Um, what was the question again? How did you get from, I want to make this low budget movie to writing on Friends? This is probably about the same time this uh, woman executive her name was Mindy Schulteis, by the way. Uh, she went on to, to an executive and then she became an actual exec. She created, she, or she was the executive behind uh, Reba and uh, some shows like that. But um, later, much later after she got out of the official business and into more of the producing business. Um, this is about the same time she said, you should be a TV writer and uh, I was working on another low budget movie with this guy who eventually became my first partner. And we wrote this thing together, this 30 minute thing together. And then he got a job uh, working on a show called Dream On, which was an HBO show that used a lot of uh, clips. They used the old, old black and white clips from the Universal Library. In, and they, if anyone's seen it, it's a really great show. It was on, it was on HBO like in very early 90s. So anyway, he was working there. The creators of that show were Marta Kaufman and David Crane, who created Friends later. So we worked with them. We were, they gave us our first job uh, writing scripts. We got to write a couple of scripts for them. And then through that, we got an agent. Through that, we got another job. We went off and worked on, a, on some shows. Uh, we worked on a show called uh, Great Scott, which starred uh, uh, Tobey Maguire and Kevin Connolly. That was on Fox. Uh, that lasted six episodes. Uh, we got to write A Wonder Years. Uh, and we worked on a couple of shows that just, you know, this shows that got canceled. And meanwhile, uh, Kaufman and Crane, Marta and David, had gone off and done a couple of shows, other shows that didn't last long, and then they did Friends. And so they had the first season of Friends, and that it was... Uh, Okay. It, I mean, it was building its audience. And that summer during the hiatus, we got a call saying from our, we were going to get on to another show. Our goal that was to get on a show that's actually going to be on for 22 episodes. So it was like a second season show, third season show, because we were tired of working on shows that got canceled. And 
so we were on our way to do that. And our agent called us and said, I think I can get you on friends. And we said, that's great. And so we went to meet with Martin David. Uh, and while we we're in our meeting, they were, the original themes theme to friends was only like 15 seconds long. And because it had become such a big hit, they, they had to expand it to a full single, a full hit song. And so when we met with them, they were sitting in their office come, doing the lyrics that eventually became the Friends song. And they looked at us, and we, this was a couple of years later than when we worked on them at Dream On. And so we were no longer the kids. We were, like, we were grown-ups. We had, we had bought cars. Uh, and they, so they said, okay, great. So we came in on second season. Mm -hmm. And it was just as the summer reruns. We start, you know, you, the season starts in May, I think. May or June or something like that. The, the writing season, pre-production starts in. And the show was just going into reruns and the, for season one was going into reruns and it just went, it exploded. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, I felt like Ringo joining the Beatles the day before they became famous. And practically. And uh, it was, there was fan mail. It was all sorts of stuff. And it was just great. It was just really great. And so just went from there. You but we, we, had, we had done, we had done probably one, two, three, four, we'd done about four shows from our first job to friends. We've probably done three shows. Mm -hmm. One thing that, that comes to mind as you talk about getting an agent and all of the communication that happens there. When I was a kid growing up in Kansas, we were, my brothers and I were all members of the uh, local 4-H club, Clover Power 4-H. And they would often read like correspondence that had come in. And I would be like, how in the hell did they get that correspondence? Like what was the network that led to somebody knowing how to email a 4-H club? Because it's not like now where you could, we'd have a Facebook page or something like that. Right. And, and so listening to you here, you t or hearing you talk about like, well, then this happened and our manager said this to this agent. How do people stay in touch, right? Because it's not like, it's not like, um, I don't know, if you wanted to go to work at uh, SpaceX, you'd be like, I got to pay attention until there's a job available and then I apply for that job. But TV writing is so much more about relationships. Did that, was that unsettling to you? Um, not so much. I think we were kind of new at mm -hmm. that time. So it wasn't really about relationships. Our, I don't know how agents, I'm sure they're on the phone with each other. They all know everything. They've got lists of what's happening. They got lists of, because later when I was doing my own shows, I would get these lists of all these writers who are available and, and, or, or if I was looking for shows, it would be all these, these are all the pilot scripts for this year. And then that's, you know, goes down to, these are all the actual pilots you know, which ones do you like kind of thing. But they, they, that's a whole world and system that I have no idea how that works. I, I've seen it work, mm -hmm. but you, I, you'd have to be an agent's assistant or something to actually sort of get into that groove. So there is but a I'm, network. I'm not, I'm not that, I can't go, I'm, I don't think I'm sociable enough to, to be an agent, basically. There, there is a network out there. We just don't understand it. It's like trying to understand the internet, more or less. Yeah. It just works. I think the reason that I asked that is, is thinking about if somebody wants to write TV, um, it is a little bit intimidating because there isn't an answer to um, how you write in TV. You know, in my engineering school days, there were all these like uh, fairs, these career fairs where Cargill and Caterpillar and GE would come and be like, we're looking for engineers. And the engineers would be like, we're, we're looking for jobs. And then they would match up. And there's nothing really like that in, in television no. um, and I, so I think that is I think the agents little, might have a little bit of that though yeah then the trick the tricky question is of course how, how do, do you, you get, get an agent right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of um, tricky questions what do you think you learned about being funny specifically writing funny over the years I think there's a way, there's sort of a way that the comedy kind of molds itself into whatever you're doing. I mean, there's a friend's kind of 
style of comedy. But, but at the same time, you're also bringing your own sort of comedy to it. There's like, I mean, there was a, one of the other writers on Friends said, oh, Michael, he's the, he does World War II and Little Animals. <laughs> so I was like, well, I did more than that. But, uh, but everyone sort of had their own kind of element. I mean, if you have, if you have 13 writers, there's 13 little ingredients that go into everything. But it can also be, that can be smoothed out into the acceptable presentation of what Friends is. And it's the same on, on all the shows, like on Seinfeld, I'm sure they, uh, people wrote those scripts and then Larry David went in and made them Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. so, so in some ways it was um, knowing your role within the context of the group yeah, I think so. I think so. But, uh, but you're bringing your own, your own sort of uh, style to it, I think. I mean, and that's why, you know, but you also, you also have to fit into what the, the format is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like I, I, I worked with someone on a show, a different show, where in the, sitting in the room around the big table, t pitching jokes, pitching, you know, storylines and dialogue. They're brilliant. They were brilliant. And then they wrote their first script and it was like for a different show. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how, how off could you, how, how do you get so off track? Right. right. Is that, is that what you would, is that what you would teach? Like how to, how to stay on track? If you could teach a master class in anything, what would it be? I think it would be, you know, I've never really thought about that. I would have to say probably just off the top of my head, probably like reading the room. Oh yeah. And uh, I've said before, I, I don't know if I said it to you before, but I've said before, there's a very fine line between having an opinion and being a dick. <laughs> yeah. And you can stick to your guns or you can, pitch you can go no seriously i think this is going to work a couple times mm -hmm. but if someone if the boss or the showrunner is saying no 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 we're moving on yeah you go okay how many you know you talk about uh, reading you until three in the morning so right they, they you don't want to hear your thing 10 times speaking of of being there till three in the morning how many people were usually in the room on friends uh we had anywhere from like 12 to 13 writers Okay. This was back in the go go nineties. <laughs> so it was a different different time. Yeah, and, and for those who are unfamiliar when we talk about a writer's room for TV, we mean that there are people usually in a room pitching ideas and then and I don't want to speak out of turn, Michael, but on on Friends, was it um were was everybody working on each episode or were they split into a couple of episodes or or how did that go? Uh depending on where we were in the schedule, uh there would always be, there's the, the room is happening. There might be a couple of people off writing scripts, mm -hmm. writing their own scripts or, or doing their outlines. And depending on how much trouble the script would be in, uh, well, th then there might be another room uh, off coming up with new stories for upcoming weeks, breaking new stories. And then, uh, once we'd had a run through and rehearsal, everyone would sort of regather and then we'd determine how much work needed to be done. And another, if we had to throw a story out or throw a, a B story out or something, a, a room of, my, of four, three or four people might go off and come up with a new story. Mm -hmm. That could then be brought back into the main room, which was going from page one to the end of the script, the main script. If you were off working on a script of your own, did you ever feel like they were talking about you because you were of gone? Of course, <laughs> absolutely. Because we were talking about the other people when they were gone. Right, I can could, I could imagine, especially amongst a bunch of comedy writers. Yeah, it wasn't hard. It, I don't know what they're saying about me, but when we were talking about them, it wasn't, it wasn't hard. Well, this is your lucky day. What if this was a, this is your life? And we're like, we bring everybody out. We're like, what did you used to say? about michael I curtis I um all right let's uh let's have a couple of questions um dave wonders this what is the most important area to nail in a spec comedy script i will i will mention that 
um, as Michael said, a lot of times um, in this day and age, spec scripts are not as much in vogue, but there is a little bit of a creeping towards wanting those again is my sense of things just from having interviewed a bunch of writers. Um, so anyway, when, when yeah, we talk I, about- I can, I've been out of that for a couple of years where I'm looking at spec scripts. So I, it could have all changed back again. As far as an, Another thing I want to say is in case there's confusion, spec stands for speculative. Probably everybody knows that, but I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So anyway, when and you're writing- sample script. Sample script is a better- Yes, yeah, sample. Well, people on, people on the inside always love to have their lingo right. and their little terms so that they can keep the rest of us out. Um, anyway, so what it, what's most important to nail on a spec script? Make sure it sounds like the show you're writing for. Don't go nuts. Mm -hmm. Make it then make it funny. Yeah, I mean I've or heard if you. It's a comedy. If it's if it's a comedy, don't make I, it funny. If it's a drama, I've heard you talk like about, and I, I appreciate this. Like, if in doubt, put a joke in there. Absolutely. Like, there's some concern. Like you're, you know, a lot of times you you or not all not a lot of time you want to always stay true to who the character is, right? And, and speak in their voice. But you should also think about how you can make it funny. Right, I agree. And a, a very small thing, this is just one of my things, but a very small thing that I think is actually more important than it sounds is make sure the script looks like their script. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, make sure the margins are the same, make sure the font is the same, because you just, the last thing you need is somebody going, oh, that's, no, that's not how we do this. That's not how we, oh, next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, we all have to remember that. Some guys got to write, read 10 of them. We have to remember always that, that these are humans and they want it to be as easy as possible to digest and consume, right? Right. Yeah, when we were, every year we'd be staffing on Friends because two or three people would not be coming back. And so, and of course we would get hundreds and hu hundreds of scripts, sample scripts. And I really, I got tired of reading. And at this time, all the specs, like we say, there's, there's specs that everybody's re re writing. So at that time, it was all Frasier, Seinfeld, uh, ch Cheers. It was like, oh, I got so tired of reading those that I said, I will, we would split them up like three or four people would be in charge of reading all the spec scripts. And I said, I'll read, I'll take all the Larry Sanders because that was, I just love Larry Sanders. And even, a, even someone writing a sample of Larry Sanders, it's going to be funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas, so they can, they can find a way to make it funny. Yeah. And where's sign? I was like, Oh, another Seinfeld, another Frazier. Um, what, uh, so Lauren wonders, what were your favorite Friends episodes that you worked on? Are there any that stick out? Is it like picking a favorite child or are there actual favorites? There are, there are favorites. It's been so long since I've actually thought of them that, that uh, let's see, I can think of specific moments that I really liked. Uh, like when Ross was trying to get the leather pants on. I remember that scene was hilarious when we were doing it. Uh, I really liked the, uh, uh, I liked the one where Ross and Rachel had sex in the museum, uh, I, cause I wrote it. Mm -hmm. I also really liked it. I mm -hmm. uh, had some really, really great moments in it. Um, uh, stuff. I love the Thanksgiving one, the ver the first Thanksgiving one I really liked. Uh, and trying to think I haven't I've been so long since I actually thought of them uh, I liked all the London stuff the two London episodes those were really great to to see to write and to see were they there were, any we're, we're oh, flying we wrote the London episode and you know we're at the end this is the end of the season it's all we're we're behind everybody's dead we've been working 24 hours a day and we wrote we wrote episode one of London. It was like, yeah, it's done. It's, we got there. And it wasn't until we, we actually arrived in London because we had to film episode one of the next season because we were going to be still in London. And we thought, oh, wait a minute. We, now we have to write that one. And we've only got like two days to do it. We're like, oh, our trip to London is going to be ruined. Mm -hmm. And David Crane wrote it on the plane over. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, geez. All right. It's so a good skill. Goes into the office and goes, I, got, I already got it. <laughs> all, we, all we had to do was sort of punch it up. It was great. Were there any that you thought this is for sure going to work and then it just didn't? Uh, yes, there was one, actually, the epi one episode I wrote, which just was the, I think it was the one where Rachel smokes, where it just didn't work and nobody could figure out why. And I couldn't figure out what it seemed to be working, but it just wasn't, it was just kind of laying there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, this was one of the episodes where at that, at that time I was running the room with, a, with uh, another guy and we've been working all night on this episode and every, every day was just a complete rewrite of the script and we just couldn't figure out what was going wrong. We didn't know what it was. And finally, even David Crane, who was not really doing the show anymore, he was doing, he had Veronica's Closet and Jesse and stuff that he was working on. He said, you know, after one run through, we had a special Thursday run through, which is normally left normally should be done by then and uh so after this thursday run through emergency run through he goes you know what i think i'll come back into the room tonight and i was like oh thank god daddy <laughs> <laughs> and so we did it and uh it still wasn't working and that's the episode where where they said the powers that be said maybe we just don't do a show this week and rather than the writers all going, oh, we failed, we all just went, wait, does that mean we get to go home early? <laughs> <laughs> they, they spoke to NBC and they spoke to Warner Brothers and the, they got back to the, 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 exec, the creators and said, even a bad episode is better than what we have on TV. So let's just do it. And so we fixed a couple of things and, and it seemed to be okay. There was another episode that wasn't working was where uh, uh, Joey had to write a play and Ross and Chandler were sort of uh, good angel, bad angel on his shoulder. And I think Chandler was the one saying, no, Ross was the one saying, come on, Joey, let's go out and have fun. And Chandler was saying, no, you said you were going to write a play, you write a play. And that wasn't working. And it was because Ross would have been the one who said, no, you stay and work. Mm -hmm. And Chandler would have been the one that's, and so all we did was, and this is kind of a no-no in, in writing, you can't just change everyone's lines around because that means their characters aren't authentic. But we said, I think Matthew Perry and David Schwimmer said, I think he, I'd be more like him and he'd be more like me. And so we said, do you mind if we just switched the lines around? And they said, sure. So we did, and it was rather than throwing the whole script out, which we thought we were gonna have to do, they, we just changed all the character the lines around and uh, you know, tweaked them a little bit, and it was fine. In other words, they said, does, does, does this mean we get to go home earlier? And you're like, yeah, it does. <laughs> so just switch those lines around. Um, anonymous attendee says this. I know who that is. From Mystery, from the Mystery Land. This person says, I'm a script writer, and I find that humor is received so differently by different people. What do you think, if you had to break it down, makes a, quote, universally, if such a thing exists, good joke? What advice would you give to someone who wants to make the average person laugh? That's a tough one, because I think when, it all, when it's all boiled down, it's really just gut instinct, I think. And I, I think it's to make a, a joke that makes the average person laugh, I think, is something that is accessible to to everyone. I think, I mean, maybe that's why, you know, comedians like uh, uh, Jim Gaffigan and people like that are just so popular because their jokes are just so, they sort of apply everywhere. There's there's nothing specific about them. Their, their, their style is specific to them, but their comedy, the jokes themselves are sort of very, they can be had, they can be enjoyed by everyone. So I think it's, if you want to do a joke, a joke that is that the average guy like, the average person likes, I'd say keep it non-specific and sort of try, try something that uh, is universal, I guess. So that might be, I might be answering the question with a, with the same question. 
How do you make well, it universal? Make it universal. You know, I, you know, you mentioned Jim Gaffigan, and um, he has he has some some good stuff about like being in an airport and seeing a Cinnabon, right? And so all comedians, too many comedians have jokes about airplanes and airports and that sort of thing. But what's true about airplanes and airports is that it is a universal experience that is very different from normal life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, there, it seems like there might be something in there too about like finding something that everybody has to do, but that's, that's not exactly like, I don't know, brushing your teeth. Although brushing your teeth, you could probably come up with something. <laughs> right. I think it's, it's, uh, it might be hard. It might be tough to, to, to actually create a joke that is accessible to everyone. Is that sort of, was that the word he used? Accessible? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think you just start to water, it just sort of becomes nothing. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like it's just come up with a joke, sort of an area that might be accessible to everyone, like you said, like airports. Mm-hmm. But what, what's your take on it? What is your thing? And if it's if people like it, they'll like it. If they don't like it, they don't like it. But it's your take. It's not you're not just a generic comedian telling mm-hmm. airport jokes. Uh, Brielle wonders, do you think comedy writing can be trained, and to how much or to what extent? Compared to writing in other genres, do you think comedy writing relies more on if the writer is a funny person, him or herself? I've worked with some comedy writers who I don't think are funny people. And they can write funny scripts. So I guess there's a little bit of training in there. Um, I think it really helps to have a sense of humor or a sense, a sense of uh, a, a different take on things. Uh, but as far as being trained, uh, I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if you can be trained, 100% trained. I think, I think you have to have sort of an understanding of what funny is. And if you're if you're not funny yourself, I think you can have an understanding of what funny is, and do it. But I don't know if there's a, I'm not sure if there's, unless you, unless you went to like improv classes or something, I don't, I don't, even, even those people are probably, they have something in them that's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, it it helps also if, if you were not um, raised in a funny household, I think it can be tricky, right? Like that's where it uh, usually comes from. Um, Yeah, and a lot of people, a lot of people build their comedy their funniness, they, they sort of build it for, like you said, if you're in a, in a funny household, you got to stay, you got to keep your dukes up with your right. comedy dukes up. Or if you're the tiniest kid in school, you know, or if you're always the new kid, like I was, mm-hmm. um, I think, I think you can hone your skills that way. Mm-hmm. Do you, this is a, a question from me. Do you ever watch friends now? No. Hmm. That makes I, sense. Uh, I can't, I have seen it, but uh, uh, like, I think we had some friend, some, some friends were over and it was like, uh, I think it was on TV. We changed the channel around and it was on TV. And to, I'll admit it, I'll admit it. I said, oh, I wrote this one. And so we mm-hmm. watched it. Mm-hmm. But uh I don't sit down and watch it. No. Do you, do you ever wonder, would you be happier as you are now? Or if you had written on five shows that were 80% as successful as friends, which is a better life? Uh, the friend's life. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's like you're saying, I don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way. Would you rather be in the Beatles? Mm-hmm. Or in Herman's Hermits, the Monkeys, uh, Jefferson Starship. Mm-hmm. Oops, sorry, and uh, you know, uh, tobacco, the, uh, the 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 uh, Nashville Teens. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Okay, well, that's good. I think this is great. This is a great spot to be then. 
because uh, I, I was going to be sad if you were not happy with your current existence. So this leaves me feeling good about oh, your, lo your lot in life. Did I, t I press some button by mistake? Is everything still going okay? Yeah, you're doing great. Okay. Um, although we're about done, so it, does, it wouldn't matter. We could have just cut you off then. Um, is there any way for people to stay in touch with you? No. Great. That's an easy answer. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Would people want to? I don't know. I think so. Probably. Find, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Ugh. There you go. Well, what's your, uh, what's your Instagram handle so people can keep track of you? Let's see. It might be called, it might be may not last. All right. Well, it seems like you're a dedicated Instagram user since you don't know your own Instagram name. No, I, I, I just don't know whether it says Michael Curtis or may not last. It says may not last. All right. So just M-A-Y-N-O-T-L-A-S-T. Yeah. Which is also, incidentally, I don't want to give away too much, but um, there you go. So follow, it's backwards. follow, uh, follow Michael at may not last, maybe um, send him a note and, uh, and pay attention. Tell him thank you uh, on Instagram for him taking the time, which I'm going to do now. Thank you, Michael. As always, it's uh, a delight to be around you. Uh, even if we're not in the same place. It was great. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, being a good leader. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. See you Bye. later. Bye.